You know, I'm reading through the messages in response to yesterday's message, and I'm not surprised of how many of you have shared the fact that you have or are going through some form of depression. I think that's, I think that it is more prevalent. You know, I think a lot of times churches put on the make happy face and everybody's happy and everybody's blessed and but the reality is it's tough. And I was sharing with somebody some of the things actually out of a book that I referenced, uh, Lloyd-Jones' Lloyd -Jones, um, Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cures. And that has been one of the things on my library shelf for many, many years. Um, a lot of people were extremely critical of Lloyd-Jones. Um, some debated whether or not he was actually, you know, because he, he was in the shadow of some other really great preachers. They kind of lessened his importance. But I think his work was very important. And this one particular book I think that uh, he put together is an incredible synopsis. And one of the things that's highlighted in that book is, if you think about it, when people get depressed, not, this is not a global picture, but when people get depressed, oftentimes people will say, you know, is God even there? Or they begin to question, why is this happening? And those questions sometimes lead to a state of unbelief, of disbelief. And I'm using that as, as a simplified term. Well, we, I'm not going to discuss the the word faith and faithing, we're just talking about terminology, the way we approach things. And that, if you want to call it disfaith, but that unbelief, he categorizes that as this, and it is essentially a sin, because you, you have drawn back from we'll call it the simplicity of the faith, the thing that drew you in the first place, and the acknowledgement that God can handle everything that you bring to Him. Now that's, you know, that's kind of a global picture, and I think that's, it can't be a one-size-fits-all approach. I think there are people who are, and suffer depression from, and I believe this, from chemical imbalance, usually on the tail end of addiction. And I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor. But there is good, um, there's abundant material, studies that show what happens to the brain. And there is definitely chemical uh, imbalance that occurs. If you think about it, when somebody has altered the balance, what we'll call what was at least harmonious to some degree, um, dopamine and serotonin and other things that now are completely out of whack, and most people don't think that those are connected to hormones in the body. It's very intricate. I mean, God created this incredible, like, He's like the greatest engineer, only he knows how he wired it, right? <laughs> but it's been proven that you can have an imbalance after that, and that can create a vacuum that can create depression. So there's, that's, that's one element. And that would require a person going to God to heal two things. 
because we're not we're not just dealing with emotions and feeling now we're dealing with something that is out of whack it's two things that need to be fixed not just one I feel down I feel depressed and I don't know why and there's other we can you can keep kind of breaking these down for some people some people go into depression after a loss now, I can tell you I didn't go into depression a full-blown depression after Dr. Scott died, but it took a toll on me. Emotionally, it took a toll on me. Um, because I was suddenly, we were like Siamese twins. We were always together. And suddenly, I'm alone. Now, I know there's at least one or two in the room here that know what I'm talking about because they're widowed as well. But you find yourself almost like not knowing what to do without that person. So I can understand the dips because I did at some point feel like I was in a low place. So grief and loss can cause that. There's so many, there's, there are so many reasons. But the main thrust of it all when you come back to everything, you kind of sift everything. As I, w I was referring to Lloyd Jones and his reference to unbelief, is I think that there is definitely a an important connection on all fronts, no matter what the cause is. That if a person is connected to God, we can have times where we say, just like that one in the Bible, "I believe, help mine unbelief." It's the ebbs and flows, it's the ups and downs, it's one day you believe you have seen the hand of God, God has intervened, and maybe a day or a month or a year later it seems as God has taken his hand away. And we might be saying, truly, thou art a God that hidest thyself. But it doesn't matter whatever, we'll say whatever the cause is, we know that God is able to touch each and every one of us in whatever our, our ailments are. And I'm, as I've been reading through the messages, not surprised, because I think it is, it is germane at some point to the Christian in different dimensions to go through that. In fact, I was having a conversation with somebody earlier, and we were talking about um, some passage out of this book I was referencing and we might be inclined to think, here are some great Christian giants of the faith, missionaries and people who have done great work and had great ministries. And then we start looking at ourselves and saying, comparatively, what have I done? Or is there anything that I've done that, that even counts or even matters? Now, not everybody's like that, but some will begin that inward um, I'm going to examine now, I'm going to peel apart, and I'm going to deduce on my own that I haven't done anything. In fact, the individual that I was having this discussion with has been uh, an incredible, important part of this ministry for many years. But, you know, we can all get into the mindset that somehow what we're doing, well, I, I answer phones or I do gardening, it's just not that in, important. If you remember, I preached a message out of Nehemiah, and I said, the little or a lot, it, doesn't, it all matters to God. And if we were all an eye, where would the hearing be? Or if we all, it's, each person has their function. So maybe that's the driving force for some. Who knows? But the cure at the heart of it all is coming back to God. And that doesn't mean that you've departed. Some people backslide and... They begin depression. Some people are fading still, but they're still depressed. Take a look at Elijah. I don't think that he, um, in that brief period between the victory on Mount Carmel to his time laying down under the juniper tree, I don't think it was uh, a, a question of, we'll call it backsliding as we know it, but more as in, it is lack of trusting that God would essentially do what he said he would do or that God would enter into his situation. And on the heels of such a victory, what a great low. 
So what I would say to you, and I would say to the ones that are specifically wrestling with this, you are not, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, don't let somebody convince you, well, if you're in this state, there's something wrong with you. Well, there may be something wrong with you as in you need to get, you and God need to get in alignment a little bit more and sort it out. And I'm, as I said, this is not like, you know, click your heels three times. You listen to this message and it'll fix everything. No. It's a point of departure. It's a launching pad for you to realize there are many people in the Bible that went through, and I use Job as an example. Have you lost everything? Has everything been taken away from you? For most of us. I'm talking about my listening audience right now. I'm not talking about Houstonians or people who've been through a tumult, but the average listener here. Has everything been taken away from you? Have you been stripped of everything? And the answer is probably no. There's probably maybe just a handful that might be, be able to answer and say yes because they may be homeless, living on the street, but mind you, they still have the clothes on their back. And yet Job has to sit through the, we'll call it the verbal onslaught of his friends. And ultimately God is dealing with him. And God could not, I believe, reach Job. It's hard for me. This is where it's, it's a hard thing for me even to imagine. God couldn't even reach Job until he had stripped away everything to get to the heart of the matter. In other words, once you are naked and exposed, once you are vulnerable, once you are in the state where everything seems, all the veneer has been taken away, God can deal with whatever it is he needs to deal with. And I think that's tough for a lot of us to kind of process that maybe some of us are in this state or go through this state while God is dealing with us. The veneer has been peeled, taken away, it's gone. There's no covering. And that's the way God usually will deal with things. So don't think there's something odd here. And if I gave you the list again of all the Christians, and these are great men of God, men who knew the word, who, when I read their lives, I think I wouldn't even be worthy to clean their toilet. You think of a man like Martin Luther. He's suffering from depression. You think of a man, and these are all incredible giants, A.B. Simpson. These are people who were prolific in their time. I mentioned William Carey. There are abundant missionaries who went to far-flung corners of the earth in the time of Livingston and others who barely converted if they had one, two, three converts in the lifetime of their ministry. And depression set in because they thought there was something, either they had committed some sin or there was something they weren't doing for God to not bless the work of their hands. Have you ever thought that? And I just mentioned some really heavy hitters and they thought those thoughts too. It makes you kind of think, wait a minute, Maybe this is part of the trip. Let me go back to some Dr. Scott teaching for a minute. Why do you need tough shoes for a trip if it's going to be like a guy who bats his eyes and tells you everything's great? Why do you need tough shoes? Because it's a tough trip. And it's not just the, we talk about the battle of faith and the fight of faith, and we tend to think it's okay, it's from faith to faith. But what happens in between from faith to faith? Sickness, we're talking about disease in the body, loss, grief, go down the laundry list. Seldom, if ever, dealt with emotional pain. You know, I said grief, sorrow, but I'm talking about something that is not just going to pass away real quickly. I mentioned, I think a week or two ago, a lady that's very dear to me. She is not a Christian. 
wrestling with the loss of her husband, who passed away over a year ago, um, about a year and a half ago now, and just cannot, there, there's no bottom for her. Now, you know, she is definitely depressed. She, I know for a time, turned to alcohol. You know what's so crazy is people who turn to alcohol, who are already depressed, alcohol is a depressant, so it sinks you even lower. And let's add in the better factor into all this. Do you think that the devil's not aware of the human frailty factor in all of this? Because that's where he loves to surfboard. does his best work riding on our frailties and our weaknesses. So Psalm 42 and 43 are important. There are plenty of other psalms in, in the Bible that I would reach into, that I would say definitely. I'm, I want to look at Psalm 42 and 43 um, just briefly tonight. But um, there are plenty of other places you could turn to that would at least... bring some, some sanity. I just randomly opened my Bible to Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. What is within you? What is within you? Your mind, your heart, your breath? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Part of those benefits, he forgives all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. And there is no, um, you know, it's, uh, he heals uh, broken bones, and he can heal cancer, and he can heal the heart. But no, he can't heal depression. That's not part of who healeth all thy diseases. It doesn't say that, does it? Healeth all thy diseases, even disease, we'll call it disease of the heart. We're not talking about heart disease, but disease of the heart, as in what we're talking about, this subject of depression. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. He's the one saying, when you have those thoughts, you were destined for this place. And also when you have those thoughts, he is the one who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things that the youth is renewed like the eagles. And we could just go on. The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. So you can reach in any place and make the application. It just takes kind of putting on the brain that says, I'm looking now at the place where I am, and I need help, and I need handles to reach into. Um, there's probably, if I would comb through here enough, there's probably... Psalm 102 contains some good kernels to hold on to that you could just say, okay, but I'm going to take you to the psalm we looked at yesterday. And I want you to just see something. I'm at Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. I went to the Hebrew, and I was looking at some of the Hebrew words for the names of God. Something dawned on me as I was doing this. I went through and I looked at all the names of God first that I had highlighted yesterday in Hebrew. But then I started looking at how many times the psalmist references God directly, either Elohim or Yahweh or some combination um, name. And equally, Indir well, call it indirectly with pronouns, because in some places where he says to thee, or um, I will still be praising thee. So this, we'll call it psalm of a godly man who's cast down, is also intermingled with a godly man that is comforted. And even though it seems like there's a contradiction of these ups and downs, it always comes back to there's more about God in here, even though it's, you know, referencing I'm down, I'm downcast, I'm, but it, there, are, there are more references to God directly and indirectly, if you will, 
in this psalm. What I thought was interesting, as I went and I translated uh, from the Hebrew, um, I had highlighted for you the living God. That wasn't so much of a surprise for me. Um, the second one, my God. The third one, I'm just going down as they appear. Uh, the God of my life. Not such a surprise. But I will say unto God my rock, le, le el, you know this word, sali, that cleft rock. And I thought, how interesting, both this one and the next reference, which is the God of my strength, which actually is really the God of my protection, the God of my refuge, place of place or means of safety. So between these two, God, my rock, and God of my strength, which is actually God, my refuge, or place of safety, I was thinking, yeah, it, it really is exactly like the song, where could I go when the storms of life are raging? I, I go to the rock. And that cleft rock, that place that's designed for me to take shelter in, the place of safety, the place of refuge. So the first thing to note is if you are in the condition like the psalmist, the first thing to note is where to run to, where to go, where to turn. Because it's very easy, as the, we'll call it the old man or the flesh nature that is lamenting, that is struggling, that is wrestling, it's very easy for that nature to reach into places first for help. And I would say, just based on this psalm, this is a little bit of a turning point. Maybe somebody says, well, I, I pray for this to go away, but it hasn't. I pray for this to depart from me, but it hasn't. When I tell you to keep doing what you're doing, I'm not anti-medication. I'm not anti any other cures, but I'd say, start here. Because the question is, have you been seeking refuge? Have you been seeking that place of refuge with God when things seem to be crashing in your mind? Or have you been seeking refuge in telling your problems to somebody else first? Or in the case of people who are addicted, reaching for the thing you're addicted to because you think that at least distracts your mind. And by the way, that's just another form of idolatry because it, it puts that front and center in your life. So these are the things I was looking at. And then, of course, if I take all this together, I still think it's interesting that what is going on here, and I noticed this in one other place, I took some notes, scratched them down. There is something kind of unique. Um, one time, the psalmist says, I shall yet praise him. One time, he says, I will praise thee. And it's interesting because I said to you, it seems like he's talking to himself at times, and other times he's speaking to God. And there couldn't be a better demonstration of almost losing where that line is while you are in prayer, because it's, you can come to pour out, instead of pour out my soul in me, pour out your soul before God, and it can be the conversation of the thing that I will do and the thing that I then yet express to him. I, I will praise thee. I will praise him. It's, it, there's, there's two things going on. I noticed that as I was picking through the Hebrew, like two split personality almost inside, inside this. But what makes this so irresistible for me to go back to is in every line, I think to myself, even though the question is asked, why art thou cast down? It's interesting that there's still this constant line of hope, hope thou in God. 
You know, there's not, why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? And I can't deal with this anymore. The next statement, it's, there's something that is on a down note, and next, the next statement is, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his continence. It's kind of interesting, this idea that a switch is being almost pulled each time the psalmist talks. Verse 7 and 8 is a prime example. If you, really, if you read that in the Hebrew, it really gives a very kind of scary impression. We tend to say, deep calleth unto deep, as in pe two people, and the Spirit bears witness. But really, in this verse, in this context, it is, it is saying the psalmist feels as though he has been overcome. He's been overtaken. And the next breath is, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And he doesn't say he's been overtaken by something else. Listen to what he says, thy water spouts, thy waves, thy billows. He's attributing what has overcome him as something of God. And by the next breath says, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime kind of reminds me a little bit of the moment of crying out for help and then saying, what time I'm afraid, I will trust. I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. There's almost this two things going on at the same time. I will say unto God my rock, my hiding place, the place where I take refuge. Why hast thou forgotten me? See what I'm saying? It's like two, two, two voices speaking. But if you keep reading, there's always hope nestled in. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. And again, it just seems to repeat itself. The prayer and the petition that is in verse 3 of Psalm 43 is something that also caught my attention. Because he says, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Now, when we talk about people who are in a depressed state, you don't think light, do you? You don't think about light. You think depression usually is associated with darkness, dark thoughts, dark attitude, dark emotions, dark spirited, right? So, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Now, I believe when we were children of disobedience and were in darkness and knew not, and we were then translated into the kingdom, his kingdom, the light of the kingdom, we, we became aware. And I've said this many times over the years, I think as you go, there is definitely, I think, Satan has perfected the technique of throwing dirt at the saints and taking pleasure and seeing them dirtied even though they've been cleansed. And if we are not going daily back to God and asking for forgiveness, daily forgiveness, cleanse me, forgive me daily, then we're also walking around with the same mindset, which then covers up, if you will, the light and the truth. That's why it's important. I mean, you can take certain things out of the Bible out of context, but it says if we, are, are, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if you're not talking to God and you're not opening up and telling him, even though he knows all about you, the things that you need to talk to God about, we can say, well, you're, you're covered. It's in the articulation of telling God and, and expressing and communicating to him. He already knows. So those people who are walking around in, we'll call it in darkness, much like the ones that we encounter in that Isaiah 50 that are in darkness and have no light. This is a good prayer. Send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me. And instead of, we'll take a little license here, instead of saying to thy holy hill and to thy, to thy tabernacles, let them lead me back to you. Because that's the premise of what's being said. I'm not saying to readjust what's, what's printed there. That's what's printed there. But I'm saying to make it applicable to you and to me. 
who might want to pray out of this psalm. Send your light and send your truth. Let them lead me. Let them illuminate me. Let them take away the darkness. And let them bring me back to you. And not that I feel that I am removed from you, but there has, there is, I believe for every person in the depth of depression feels as though God is far away. So this is a wonderful prayer right here. Just this third verse is a wonderful way to kind of work your way into a psalm if you're in the middle of trying to figure out how do I, how do I at least begin. And I think once that first step is taken, that first step of verse 3 of praying that, I think there may need to be many times repeated. I don't think something happens and, and God can take it away in a minute, in a flash. That's true. But I think repeatedly going back and praying this. Why? Because God is light and God is truth. You're basically asking God to send more of him to you, to lead you and to guide you and to bring you back to him. And in that state of mind, you are much like, and I am much like the prodigal, just turning back and saying, in my father's house there was bread enough to spare. I'm going back. This is the continuance because it's the reality that God can provide the light and can light up the darkness of my spirit, whatever has overtaken me, whatever has taken over me. God can lift that away and he can also light my spirit again. Why that's important? Because it says, I will go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. And that's kind of a wonderful thing because once you begin the steps back, at least in praying that, verse 3, I think there can be a reconnection to see God provides the capacity for the light and the truth once more, and joy can come and be restored. And remember the most important thing. Satan loves to rob the saints of joy. You start off in a rosy glow, and it starts off all nice and innocent and kind of ignorant in a way because you believe certain things in, in ignorance you don't know. And as time goes on, you get a little, we'll call it a little more battle-scarred, and it's a little less rosy, and it's a little less pleasant. Suddenly you're in the middle of a battle, and you're fighting spiritual battles. And the first one, you don't know what it is, but as time goes on, you've got scars from the battles. You begin to see this is the process, and you, that can wear you down. In the process, the joy of walking with the Lord and being a Christian can be taken. It can be robbed. Because Satan definitely knows how to do that. So... All I'm telling you is this is a wonderful place to meditate and I highly suggest if you're going to pick through this, there's ways to, you know, you can study this by circling the names of God as I did. You can study some of this in a different way. I actually was going to arrange this um, to present it to you in a different way. I circled all the P words, panteth, pour out, prayer, praise and plead from the two psalms and then I began to kind of open up what each of them might mean to the psalmist in context and then to me. So there's a lot of ways to go at this, um, but the most important thing for those people who are needing encouragement, um, I think it's, I've said many times, there's something for everybody in this book. And if this is what you're going through, Recognize one thing, there is a cure in God's book for a downcast spirit. And for some, it comes quickly. I don't know how long Job suffered. All I know is ultimately at the end, he came to his senses to say, basically, God, you know what you're doing and you're in control. It's not for me to say. And if I was uh, one of those crazy evangelists that tells you that you can get everything back. I'd say, just be like Job, and God restored his riches and then some. Well, that's Job. But God can restore your mind, your mental state of the health of your mind. And God can also restore, restore the joy that was in your heart before you sank to the place where you're finding yourself right now. Just remember one thing. 
you're not alone. As I flip through the messages, I'm finding, as I said, a lot more people than you might think that have gone through or are going through, which means one thing, cheer up, saints. <laughs> but I'm not going to say it's going to get worse for this one. I'm going to say, cheer up, saints, stay in the word, keep connected to God and keep faithing. God will send his truth and his light into your heart and your mind, and you'll be healed in Jesus' name. Get on the telephone. Come to this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord. Worship and bow down before Him, exalt His name today. Come to this house.